you say pour water into the glass but not pour the glass with water? Why can you say fill the glass with water but not fill water into the glass? The solution to those puzzles kept ending up using these fundamental concepts like causation, like time, uh, like object. And that's across many different languages. The particular constructions in a language obviously vary. The particular rules that determine which words you can or can't use vary. But they fall into universal patterns, and they've been documented in hundreds and hundreds of languages. And this reveals something then about how we see the world as humans, and what we know about it, and, and you know, are there other possibilities for how we might do this? It's very difficult to step out of your, your own human nature and... and think of other ways of conceptualizing how we move around in the world. But. It is, but in, in large part, that's what science does. Science allows us to step outside our minds and have a more accurate picture of reality than the one that evolution uh, supplied us with. Uh, an example is that in physics, there is, in, in the various theories of time, uh, none of them have a concept of now as being a privileged point. The concept of n past present and future, doesn't enter into the laws of physics. Likewise, the idea of, of impetus, the idea of an agent applying a, a force on an object which it then carries with it until it dissipates, is the natural way in which we conceive of, of uh, physical interactions. But of course, Newton blew it out of the water. And many of the fallacies that students make before they have internalized Newtonian physics correspond to the mental model of the world that gets expressed in language. So actually at the boundaries of science then, that it seems like language is almost a hindrance. I wouldn't say it's, it's a hindrance so much as that the, uh, the, the construal of the world on which language is based, which extends beyond language to our common sense reasoning, that is in, in large part a hindrance. That a lot of science education and a lot of the progress of science consists of debugging or unlearning the intuitions that we bring into the lab. Uh, the intuition, for example, that every kind of animal has a, an essence that makes it that kind of animal. You can't have evolution if you believe that. You've got to start thinking of species as populations that can vary continuously in traits, and the distribution of traits can change over time. But that's very different of thinking of cats as having a kind of catness that determines their catty features. Now, will challenges like quantum physics, for example, at the boundaries of science then ever really make sense through the lens of language? Well, because language is a combinatorial system, that is, we don't have a finite list of messages that we pick from a list, but we've got a grammar that allows us to combine nouns and verbs in uh, an explosive number of combinations. Also, language has uh, in it metaphor, not metaphor in the sense of a literary ornament, but metaphor in the sense of uh, allowing us to take an idea that works for one system, bleach out all of the content that's specific to that system, and apply it to a second system. We do this all the time in language. We don't even realize it. When we say John went from sick to well, we use sp spatial verbs, went, from, and to, even though we don't mean that he literally moved. It's as if his health moved in a kind of state space. Now, that's the kind of ability of taking concrete language, erasing the concrete bits, and applying that skeleton to more abstract domains that we use in science all the time. And I suggest in the book that the combination of metaphor and analogy with the combinatorial power of language is what allows language to express thoughts, such as scientific thoughts, that can be quite alien to our instinctive way of analysing the world. And outside of science, of course, metaphor is also one of your key themes in the book and something that's very important to this power of language to be so combinatorial, so um, prolific, if you like. That's right. So thermodynamics was originally conceptualised by an analogy to the flow of liquid. Um, the atom was originally analogised to a solar system. Now, of course, you can't take the analogies at face value if you do serious science. You've got to say that the analogy works in this way and that way and this other way, but not in the following seven ways. So you have to be, that's one major difference between the use of metaphor in science and in art. But nonetheless, uh, uh, scientific language is suffused with, with metaphor. A selection in the case of evolution, of course, Darwin used the analogy of animal breeding. 
Uh, the genetic code, code originally meant something that cryptographers used. Now we think of it as an information mapping system. So science uh, uses metaphors not just to communicate, but actually to pinpoint certain abstract systems that are often shared between the thing you're talking about and the source from which you drew the metaphor. Sometimes when there's a new concept and there isn't already a way of expressing it, as you've just been telling us, we devise a new metaphor for it or a metaphor that can allow us to compare one thing with a very similar thing. But at other times, we might just make up a new word. I mean, what's what affects whether a particular word in the first place gets made up at all and in the second place makes it into language or not? Uh, it's often capricious what words will um, fill a gap in, in the lexicon and which ones will catch on, both in the language as a whole and in scientific language in particular. The mere need for a word does not guarantee that it will spring into existence. We don't have a word for unmarried heterosexual partners, for example. To talk about you know, my girlfriend sounds a little juvenile when you're 53 years old. Uh, to talk about my partner makes people think that you're gay. To talk about my lovers just seems a little too romantic for you know a dinner invitation. Uh, and despite the sexual revolution in the 1960s and the proliferation of unmarried heterosexual partners, no word has filled the gap. Likewise, there's no commonly accepted word for the first decade of the 21st century. The, the aughts, the noughts, the, 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 the double O's, nothing really has caught on. And when a, a word does catch on, it's often unpredictable where it comes from. My favorite example is the term for bulk email, spam, which came from a, a Monty Python skit uh, through a, a circuitous path. Science isn't immune to uh, these waves of, of uh, fashion and how where names came from. In uh, several decades ago, the only legitimate way of introducing scientific jargon was to use a bit of Greek or, or Latin jargon. So you'd get terms like heteroscedasticity or apoptosis. Uh, then I think with the greater informality of the culture as a whole and probably the uh, decline of classical Latin and Greek education, scientists started using common sense English descriptions, like frequency dependent selection, for example, or secondary messenger. And now, as I think a new and even less formal cohort of scientists has entered the profession, uh, you get even whimsical coinages becoming acceptable scientific terms, like sonic hedgehog, as the, the name of a, of a, a gene, or uh, quarks, which came from Marie Gelman, brain, short for membrane, uh, in physics, which cuts a word in the wrong place in a kind of whimsical way that's reminiscent of campus slang 